There can be little doubt that the human experience has changed more drastically in the last 250 years than in all of recorded history. The Industrial Revolution and the rapid expansion of technology that came with it spurred an almost immeasurable capacity for humans to alter the natural world and their lives within it. This massive upheaval began two and a half centuries ago in Great Britain, a European nation-state then on the verge of building a worldwide empire. In the central west region of England, in a country called Shropshire, there is a narrow valley through which the River Severn flows. Spanning the waters is a small iron bridge. Built and completed during the time of the American Revolution, it was the first structure to be built completely out of cast iron. The purpose of Iron Bridge's construction was to allow for easier travel between the area's coal mines and the nearby ironworks. Today, Iron Bridge is a tourist attraction. Its pathways open only to pedestrian traffic. An iconic symbol of the Industrial Revolution's birth, the bridge and the foundry which produced it also serve as a figurative link between the limitations and the revolution of possibilities. A short hike into the next valley brings the tourists to the blast furnace of Colebrookdale. For generations, the Darby family worked and shaped iron in this furnace. By the close of the 1700s, Darby's furnace was lighting up more than just the night sky. The art of metallurgy, its secrets illuminated, would soon change all of human life. If the Severn River Valley is the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, then the region just 60 miles to the north must be its heart. Dominated by rival cities, Liverpool and Manchester, this northern region of the United Kingdom began a massive transformation at the start of the 1800s. A transformation that would be repeated almost universally in the next 200 years. If one were to scale the television tower above Bolton on Winter Hill, they could perhaps view a span from the Irish Sea to the Pennine Mountains in the west. To take this unlikely scenario a bit further, Let's now throw in a time machine. 200 years ago, Winter Hill's television tower would have offered an amazing vantage point to witness the rapid-paced growth of production and population, as well as environmental degradation. As Manchester and Liverpool grew, they would swallow up other existing communities to form regional areas of urban development. Known as a conurbation, this pattern of growth woven by the Industrial Revolution would become even more pronounced with the development of the steam locomotive. From the imaginary observation post on Winter Hill, one would also witness the creation of the world's first true railway. Moving closer to Manchester, real perspective on the changes brought by the Industrial Revolution can be found. Just three miles north of Manchester's city central is Kersall Moor an elevated space of nature that has somehow endured. A popular subject for artists, Manchester is barely visible on the horizon of this 1820 painting. Contrasted to another piece, painted less than four decades later, are the chimneys of the factories and mills which earn the city the nickname Cottonopolis. Such scenes are unrecognizable to those born in the new millennium. Manchester today has reinvented itself, as so many western cities have as a center for business, education, culture, and sports. Still, the legacy of the Industrial Revolution isn't hard to find. Perhaps the most important reason for Manchester's initial growth was the fact that three rivers converged within the city. With the Irk and the Medlock flowing into the larger Irwell, Manchester's heritage as an important crossroads dates back to the Roman era. Around the 1650s, as the Puritans were making Massachusetts Bay their home, Manchester was an established market town and regional trading center. By the 1750s, its population had grown to 15,000. However, Manchester was no different from many of the other communities that would later become the United Kingdom's largest cities. As in London, Birmingham, and dozens of other places, newly built canals were changing the economic environments of Great Britain. Before the invention of railways, canals bridged communities together. With their narrow cuts through the land, these aquatic highways defied geography and helped make Great Britain an economic engine. Local business was no longer determined by local resources. Amounts of cargo that would have taken months to transport were now moved in a matter of weeks. By the 1830s, there would be over 4,000 miles of canals dug up and down the country. Manchester is a city of canals. 
Like urban canyons, they cut through the landscape. By 1800, 70,000 people that now made up the town's population had moved up to and beyond the canals. By 1851, over 400,000 would join them. How Manchester grew so rapidly is perhaps best explained by this Irish theme music and professional videography. The wheel is started, controlled and stopped by means of a curved sluice. The water wheel is contained within the building and it is centred on its iron axle by means of tapered wedges, typical of millwright practice. A demand for metal parts caused the number of furnaces like Darby's to multiply. The wallower here turns at two and three quarter times the speed of the water wheel itself. In less than a century, mechanics would be applying this technology to automobiles. What made Manchester's mills so different was the fact that it wasn't water that powered them. Canal boats and later trains brought coal to the mills where steam engines, like the ones patented by James Watt in 1786, now perform the movements once driven by water. This in turn created a demand for coal which was dug out by hand in ever-increasing dangerous conditions. Manchester grew dramatically and suffered for it. Noted at the time for its horrible air quality, Manchester also had a housing shortage. New neighborhoods grew up, but the demand didn't stop. The poor were crowded into cramped conditions and lived within close proximity to their mill or factory of employment. Most of the deteriorated housing of that era is now gone, replaced by steel and glass as well as parking lots. My wife and I were able to eat a delicious meal at the Angel Pub, a traditional establishment in the neighborhood of Angel Meadow, which sits atop a former cemetery where over 40,000 souls still rest. In 1847, a potato blight caused a famine in Ireland. 30,000 people were crammed into the neighborhood around Angel Meadow, Unsurprisingly, the area had already suffered a horrible cholera outbreak. What is surprising is the fact that these people survived and endured in such conditions. We in the Western world today live as beneficiaries of their labored agency. You tyrants of England, your race may soon be wrong. You may be brought into account for what you've surely done. It's easy to wonder if they, in their time, with all its perils and opportunity, could have imagined the modern world which they were building. It wasn't that long ago. Bringing to this country to cotton, everything. Every town had mills mills and mills. They're the lifelines, the lifeblood of the community. The Industrial Revolution isn't just a study of changing technology. It's an invitation to explore the role of gender, social change, and the issue of social class, a topic practically invented by Karl Marx during his time in the north of England. And yet, this region was not done changing the modern world. Below is the town of Rainhill, located between Manchester and Liverpool, it was chosen as the proving grounds for a competition between competing steam locomotives in 1829. Stevenson's rocket won the day, and its successors were soon riding the rails between the two cities at the breathtaking speed of 30 miles an hour. No longer a fair amusement, locomotives were moving people and freight between Manchester and Liverpool on the world's first railway a year later. Within 30 years, railroads had sprung up across the world, and nothing has ever been the same since. Trains and the rails they ran on altered human perception, not only in terms of distance, but also in our relationship with time. Weeks on the canal now meant hours by rail. Cities grew larger still, 
as people were able to live further away from their jobs. Economies expanded as commerce flowed between continents like never before. In the quickly flowing rapids of New England's rivers, America too had begun its industrial revolution. Mills sprung up in cities and towns across the region. The possibilities were wide open, especially in a country that was just grasping at how large it had become.